A good morning to everyone. Today we'll be looking at the applied networking chapter in our IT Essentials cluster, which will go partially into answering some of the tasks in the third assessment for ICT 421. The rest of the assessment can't really be answered until we sort of install some operating systems and that so i'm not pushing assignment number three as one to be completed quite yet we'll do it later as we get a little bit further into covering the material we need to cover so morning our device and network connection needs to be explained. So how do we connect devices to the network is what that little bit of um, 6.1 is covering. And 6.2, we introduce you to problem solving techniques and methods that not only apply to computers and networking, it's how you should approach and I think that you need to troubleshoot. So connecting devices into a network, well first of all you need to understand the way addressing works within networks and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to cover this chapter before we did the virtual machines is it explains how addressing works and how you connect into a network. So connecting virtual machines into networks will make more sense after this. So we have two levels of addressing. We have a physical address, which is equivalent to your you know, mailing address at if you're using normal mail. And then you have your logical addressing, which is like equivalent to a telephone number. It is not reliant on the, a physical location. It's assigned to you as you open your account, regardless of your physical address. And that's pretty much how IP addresses work as well. So we need these two addresses to work together to give us a unique address for our individual device. So if you remember us talking about um, the different ways of communicating, we have to have a physical pickup of the frame of the cables. So the device needs to know that that electronic frame or message, part of the message is for it in particular, not everybody else. So the physical address tells the device to listen and look at the message as it arrives. And this is known as a MAC address within the ethernet network. Then the logical address, which is, we'll just concentrate on IPv4 for a moment, is where we assign the address for the group of devices in a network segment and an individual host within that network. So IPv4, as we'll look at a little bit more in depth in this chapter, is made up of four octets of information, because IPv4 is 32 binary digits, and we show that in dotted decimal form. Now, so that's the IP address that you may be familiar with for those that have um, done some networking or 
connected a PC or set up a printer or something like that. So you'd be familiar with that format. With IPv6, which drastically increases the number of networks and hosts that we can have in the world, it uses hexadecimal addresses and it is displayed in groups of four hex digits separated by columns. And we'll look at the rules around how we can short, shorten that and make it easier to write. So basically we need a physical address and a logical address to be able to send information from a source to a destination regardless of its IPv4 or v6 that we use as a logical address. One of the ways we can use to determine what our physical and logical addresses on our host machine is, is using the command ipconfig slash all in a command window. And for each adapter that you have connected to that operating system, it'll give you the adapter type, the MAC address, whether it's using DHCP, its IPv6 addresses, and we'll get into that later, IPv4, subnet mask, default gateway. So the three things that you need to configure on a host machine is an IP address, its mask, and its gateway. Or if we're using DHCP, it needs to be pushed out. So how does a network address determine where to send traffic? Well, we send traffic via routing routers using the network portion of the address space. So we have a network portion and a host portion. So the network portion represents the cable that the hosts hang off. Now, I'll just need to uh, bring my little scribble pad over. So I should have set this up before class started. I forgot I was going to be uh, inclined to uh, scribble during this little sessions of and that's I need to change under options to pen and then go back. So you need to understand how Ethernet started. So Ethernet started where we had a router and basically a very long piece of coax cable and we would put a T into that coax cable and hang a computer off it. Okay, so every time we wanted to connect another host machine, we would put a T in. So the network represented the cable and then the host portion represents the individual machines within that cable. Now, as technology advanced, we introduced switches and all this lovely stuff. So we don't hang off a single piece of cable anymore like we used to with coax. So things have changed a little bit, but the principles on how protocols work and how communications work are still the same. So we need to identify two portions of an address. We need to identify the network and the individual host 
within that network space. And the way we represent or keep track of how many bits are network, how many bits are host, is by using the subnet mask and basically what we'll um, talk about later is the ending process. So you'll notice here that we have a whole series of ones. So when a one is shown, it's a network bit. So the value that is in the IP address just falls through, it's kept. In the host portion, which is this tail end, all the bits in the subnet mask are zeros. So that turns that entire host portion to zeros. This is called an ANDing under BOLAN functions, which is a mathematical bit of double speak, okay, for most people. And basically, simple rules where there's a one, the original value is kept. Where there's a zero, it turns to a zero. So what you are left with is only the network portion of the address. And that's what our routing protocols use to forward traffic through our, our IP network, is that network portion. They don't care about the individual hosts. They just want to know what part of the segment, network segment, you're hanging off so it can forward it to that piece of cable. So IPv6 has a very unique and large addressing system. And we'll be doing a chapter on decimal and hexadecimal and binary in Thursday's classes fairly shortly. And there's a whole chapter on converting back and forth. And so the way we represent hex digits and numbers is in pairs. Okay, so whenever you write a hex number, there's always two digits. So within IPv6 rules, we always write in groups of four However, so what we need to understand is in hex, if we have a zero before a number, we don't need to write that zero because it doesn't actually change the value of the pair. But if it's after the number, well, it does change the pair. So, you know, five zero is very much different to zero five. So within this space, we know the total number of groupings. And we also have a rule that says we can drop leading zeros out of a pair. So we don't need to show that zero because we know zero D has to be a pair. So we could represent that as DB eight. Quite fun. Because we know there's going to be four hex digits within those two columns as represented here. Now there's another rule that we'll talk about in a minute. So in this first example, we're just dropping out all our leading zeros and making the address shorter. Because we know between these two columns, there's four digits. Now, 
there's another little rule there that says we can omit all zeros between two colons, but we can only do this once. Because if we did it more than once, we wouldn't know where how many zeros to add back into the address. So in this example still here, if we replace all these zeros here with a double colon, we effectively have replaced those 12 zeros with just two columns. Much easier for us to write. And we can work out how many zeros to put back in because we know the rules that, well, there's supposed to be four digits here, so we can put a leading zero there, insert three there, and we'll get back out to our addresses. And here, we know we need to make up enough zeros to get back to our total address space. Takes a little while to get used to, but it's important to understand the addressing rules. Why is it important? Well, if we're doing manual addressing, or as they've called it, static addressing, we need to know the rules so we can enter those numbers in as quickly and as efficiently as we possibly can. So as a general rule of thumb, we should always have an IP address, a subnet mask, a default gateway, and a domain name server address. This is the service that translates our web addresses into IP addresses. So it's kind of important, unless you physically know all the IP addresses of all the devices you want to communicate with anyway. So the difference between the IPv4 screen and the IPv6 screen is the way we represent the subnet mask. We just record the number of bits used as a prefix length in IPv6. That says there are 64 consecutive ones in the subnet mask. Over here, it says there's 8, 16, 32 consecutive ones. And nobody's going, but Mark, you skipped a number there. 8 and 8 is 16, and 8 is 24. I normally have a, a look of confusion on students' faces when I play that trick. I know it doesn't quite translate with remote learning because I can't see your faces. But, and it's too early in the morning. Yeah, so. All right, so dynamic addressing is so much easier for us to uh, configure and it's our default setting on our devices and that's obtain an IP address automatically and obtain a DNS server automatically. The machine, when it powers on, will send out a request to the DHCP server saying, give me an address, please tell me my default gateway. Tell me where I can find the DNS server. So it's fine. So IPv6 uses a, another naming convention called a link local which it configures automatically regardless of your static or manual IPv6 configuration. And all what it is representing is a dynamic address that it uses just within this network segment to talk to other devices within that local network. 
it cannot be used to communicate off the network. Okay, and you can tell these addresses because they always start with an FE80 address. So basic components that we use within a network are, yeah, thanks very much. Why you keep coming up while I'm doing presentations? Don't you love Microsoft? Okay, so we have a connection from our ISP coming into our house and we have some form of modem or device that connects our network within our house to the ISP. Then we have our wireless router that we own that provides connectivity to our machines within the home. So this is the same for every network, regardless if it's your home or outside. Everybody subscribes to a service provider. The service provider provides an interface to connect to their network, and then we connect our devices to their network. How do we connect devices to a network is via network interface cards. And these come in various shapes and sizes and functionality. So we have a wired, wireless, we have a USB. Now these ones plug in to the expansion slots on the motherboard. That one's a USB insert. And then the one that's not shown is the inbuilt one that's built into the motherboard itself. So how do we connect it? Well, you power off your device, you insert your network card, turn it back on, and it will detect the new card. Because everything's plug and play now. So if we looked within Device Manager, which we'll, we'll explore when we do the operating system components, we can see new devices being added under the network adapters. And we can expand that and get more details on the driver being used to talk between the operating system and the actual hardware. We can update the driver, we can disable it, i.e. turn it off, or we can totally uninstall it if we need to. Now under Windows 10, basically Windows looks after the drivers. In the dim dark days, you had to go and install specific drivers for that card from the vendor. You still have to do that with other operating systems. All right, so configuring the network card, as we said, you basically, you can have it just on automatic or manual. Okay, there's another one called Boot P. Nobody really uses that anymore because Boot P was the predecessor to DHCP. So, easiest thing to do is just turn on, as we're talking wireless, just turn it on and it'll connect to the access point and do all that configuration automatically. Now, in later in this chapter, we'll talk about how to set up a wireless router so you can connect these devices to it. So if you've never done it, we'll cover it. All right. How do we check whether we can communicate between devices we can do it by using a ping command, which basically sends a 
message to the other device and says, are you there? Can we talk? And the protocol it uses to send this message is Internet Control Message Protocol. And the actual command for those tech heads that are actually is called an echo. Okay, so that's the function within ICMP that it ping uses to talk to the other end. So it sends a echo request and gets an echo reply back and it measures the time it took to get there and back and whether all the bytes received. So it gives you a status. I sent four requests, I received four replies, nothing was lost and gives you the average times that it took to have that conversation. That's the basic command. Over here we can see by using the forward slash question mark, all the variables to the command that we may want. Now, you can change the number of requests it sends. You can tell it to keep sending it until you tell it to stop. You can change the size of the request. There's lots of different things you can use. Okay. Notice here, we can change it to IPv6 by forcing it. So how do we connect devices in? If it is a wired network, it's very easy. We just plug the cables in. So in modern day computers and network, especially in the domestic front, we have everything that is lovely, lovingly, lovingly color coded. And so our switch ports within our domestic router are generally yellow. And our WAN ports are blue. Okay. And when we look at the modem, you probably find that it's color coded as well. They're trying to make it as simple as possible for anybody so they can just plug and play. So we plug a cable end into our modem, plugs into our router, and then from our router, we plug into our device. Wide networks are very easy to use. You should be able to then log in to that device to configure it. Now, depending on the vendor, the default address space that it uses may change. And the username and password may change. Like some of them actually, especially in the early days, you had to type in full administrator. Okay, not just admin, those things. Now, every device will have a default username and password shipped as part of it and refer to your documentation for the address and what those are. So once you log in, you'll get a menu system. Now these menu systems on today's devices are very user friendly and fairly straightforward to follow. Number one thing you should always do is change your password get rid of that default password because anybody can use the default password and access your device. So that's bad. It will then ask you to re-log in with a new password after you've changed it. And then under setup, 
we should be able to set our DHCP settings, uh, auto config. What addresses are we going to use to push out to our host machines? Okay, can I use the 10 network? And that's the subnet mask. We're turning on the DHCP server. How many addresses are we going to use? Well, we're going to use 100. So on and so forth. So that tells it how, what addresses it can use to send to devices that are connecting to it. Next, we want to set up our wireless network. So we go into our wireless settings and we can fix it to a certain type of network. So if we only want to accept N wireless cards, we put it on N only. The default would be mixed, which means any GB or N cards can connect. The downside to having a mixed network is it will downgrade to the lowest standard that is connected to the wireless network. So your card might be an N, which is capable of doing 300 megabits a second, but somebody might have a very old network card that's only able to do 10. Guess what? Your entire wireless network now does 10. All right. Service set identifier, SSID. This is the name of your wireless network. All devices that want to connect to this network can search for that SSID and communicate with the access points that are on this service set. You then can manually set the channel. If it's a newer router, it will be automatic. Leave it on automatic and it will try to find the clearest channel within your area. Because how it works is you have a little aerial and it sends out radio waves within a radius of that aerial. And that frequency that it's talking on is set here. And basically how it works is you have a set of channels that have frequencies that come up and down in signal strength. Now each channel is only slightly shifted from a, the previous one, so they actually overlap quite a lot. So out of the standard 11 channels that you get in the 2.4 gigahertz range, uh, those three channels are the only ones that are clear from each other. So if you look at them, they're the three channels that don't overlap with each other within that spectrum. All right. They have other channels that overlap within each other, but there's three distinct, ooh, sad face, um, channels from each other. So security mode. This is where we set up our passwords for our wireless network because we don't want just anybody connecting to our network and using our bandwidth. So WPA2 personal means it's going to use a pre-shared key, not look for a server to check the key. So encryption, AES or TKIP, um, AES is the more secure of those two. How long in seconds will we recycle this key checking? And 
our actual password. Do not use simple passwords like that. Very easy to get a hold of. Now, one of the um, misconceptions with server set identifiers is there's an option generally in the configuration to hide the SSID. That doesn't actually hide it. It just tells the client not to show it. Okay, because the access point has to identify itself with a beacon and the SSID is embedded in the beacon information all the time. Part of the protocol. So to set it up, we've set up our wireless and then we have other wireless access points that we can use in a what's called a wireless mesh and we join them to the same service set and each of them should be on a different channel so that they use a slightly different frequency to transmit on and the way the mesh works is it overlaps each other all right so the signal radius around and my circles are terrible i know that you know that so this overlap is used to connect these two wireless devices together and back to the base station now the being a mesh, hopefully all your circles overlap with everybody else and it gets a good signal via radio back to the base station and extends the overall range of good signal strength throughout your location. I'll um, give you an example that I actually use here at home up until the weekend where my second device died but okay so I have my primary wireless in the garage why is it in the garage because that's where my service provider terminates their equipment so that network only gets to about 45% of my house. So not very useful. So what I did is I connected a cable to here, connected another wireless router, disabled all the DHCP and all that and connected this point into a switch port socket. So I'm only using this as a switch and a wireless access point. So this was part of uh, E3 and that's part of E3 as well and they communicate to each other via a wired connection and a laptop or any wireless device can sync to either of those two access points now unfortunately that was an old device that was kicking around for years and years it did this to me on the weekend. <laughs> so I've actually purchased a mesh system to install in the house. So I'll give you a review on that and how effective that is um, when it arrives and I get it installed. Downside to using um, secondary 
wireless routers as extenders like this is if they're old and they lose power, they may reset to their defaults, which is to work as a main gateway to a network. So they end up fighting each other for a path out. And this vendor and this vendor used exactly the same IP addressing range. So they really did conflict with each other. So every now and then I'd have to reset totally reconfigure this device because it lose all of its settings and it finally died Saturday so my two boys are very upset because they've only got one bar of wireless in their rooms instead of four <laughs> so I'll show, show you the uh, or do a review on meshing in a home from personal experience in the coming weeks once I get that back. So one of the problems we have with IPv4 is a lack of addresses. So we came up with a system called a network address translation that converts one address to many. So you can have lots of individual devices connecting to your home network and all convert to one live address to the outside world. So your ISP provides you with one address and you can have as many as you like within your network. Another function of networks is quality of service. We need quality of service when we provide a converged network. In other words, we're running voice, video and data all on the same network infrastructure. We've got to tell it which type of traffic gets priority over others. So we're setting up queues and the number one queue is serviced first. So we have high priority while you put Counter-Strike on high. This is not set up <laughs> correctly. All right. Um, basically, if you are playing Counter-Strike, you could be dropping phone calls. But online gaming, the actual IP traffic that goes off to the service isn't that high, so I suppose you'd get away with it. So basically, you set the priority of the traffic and the type of traffic, and you go from high to low, and it will treat the traffic in these queue descriptions as per the priority. So if it's Traffic comes in for the IP phone policy. It's got higher priority. So when it arrives, you've got your usual bouncer at the front door and you've got your priority entrance. The IP phone comes along and the bouncer lets them straight through the door because they've got high priority. Okay. Your general Joe Blow Nottala turns up and they just get left in the queue to wait with everybody else. All right, so you're basically setting up your VIP traffic. Universal plug and play just means we don't have to manually set up every hardware address within our system and it'll sort it all out themselves. Very nice, easy to use. Is there a security problem? Well, yes, but that's for another day. DMZs, demilitarized zones. So basically what we're doing is we're saying 
any traffic that comes from the internet can go straight to our DMZ without a problem and not basically see our internal network. Some devices will allow this easily, some won't. So basically this DMZ zone sets up a separate network. Okay, so it's not, so effectively you're putting a logical barrier. And if my pen works around these devices. You're telling the internet traffic that you can't see these, but you can come in and talk to my web server. Fine, not a problem. But you can't come in and talk to these devices. It's not allowed. We can turn around and initiate a conversation out and then get our answers back. That's fine. But traffic that originates in the big bad world of the internet can only travel to our DMZ zone, not here. Now, port forwarding is a must for gamers, which I'm assuming some of you are by comments made. And basically the way port forwarding works is we identify the application via the port number. And we say the traffic coming in on the external port 80 use internal port 80 and send it to this IP address. Now, so you would set up as per that first example back there. What were they playing? I can't remember. Go back, go back. Counter strike, there you go. So in your port forwarding, you would have the counter strike ports listed and what, whether they're TCP or UDP and you'd have to leave it on the network address too, because generally speaking, your gaming machine would have a dynamic IP address assigned to it, not a static one. So you would just forward it to the network. MAC address filtering can be set. So basically what you're doing is you're saying only these addresses can connect to my access point. Can this be bypassed? Yes, with a bit of software that is very easy to get. I can set it so that the MAC address in my headers in my traffic conform to an address that I see works on your network and get in via that way. Um, so if the person's got any sort of mouse, can bypass that easily. White listing and black listing. So basically traffic filtering based on web addresses that we will allow or not allow. So basically you, okay, you go type in, if it's a white list, we would put in like cisco.com. If it's a blacklist, it's that one that starts with P and goes hub, you know the rest. So Internet of Things is the big catch cry of networking for the last couple of years. Basically anything and everything can be connected to a network and most of these things are very small devices that connect to give status updates. For example, your um, air conditioner 
will check in with your network and send a control message saying, I'm on, I'm on temperature, everything's good, catch you in another five minutes and shuts down. That is basically the internet of things. It's just constant status of small, very small, minute traffic on lots of devices that aren't constantly there. So within Packet Tracer, which we'll um, spend a bit of time on today, I think, if people want to go through Packet Tracer today, there's actually a couple of activities corresponding to this chapter that are in Packet Tracer. So it makes sense to go through it today. Um, we have an entire section dedicated to the Internet of Things. So we've got solar panels, um, sensors, fans of all different types, monitors, they even got video cameras in here, you know, speakers, garage doors, you name it, door locks. So lots of different options to generate traffic within the Internet of Things. Now, troubleshooting. Troubleshooting is fun. You get to do it a lot as a network administrator. Excuse me while I wet the whistle. So, basically, the six steps are you identify the problem, you come up with a theory as to what caused the problem, and from that you have developed a theory on the action plan to fix the problem, and you need to test whether your theory is correct or not, i.e. does your solution work? If it does, you document everything and move on with your life. If it doesn't resolve the issue, you go, first of all, you undo the change you just did in trying to fix the problem. And then you go back to step two and come up with another theory. Rinse and repeat until you come up with a solution that works. Okay. Very simple process, really. So, some of the things you need to do. Remember that business requirements thing about open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. See, it does have relevance. <laughs> okay, so one of the things you need to do is find out what the problem is. So that needs you to generally interact with this little mob of people called users, which you'll come to love if you're on a help desk or networking help solutions of any kind because they're the ones that nine times out of ten are the cause of your headaches but you need to get them to explain what they did when the problem occurred not what they believe is the problem so there's a whole series of questions like did you just install software was there any changes like was a printer moved recently anything like that you develop a set of questions to help you identify what the device was doing at the time the fault occurred so you can try to work out what the actual fault is So, network 
I can't connect to the browser, won't connect to the website anymore. Why can't I talk on the web? Well, there's lots of different reasons. You could have a bad cable. Your network card could be shoddy. Your service provider might go down. Um, if you're on wireless, maybe something's happened that caused the signal strength to drop and you've lost connectivity. So you need to ask questions to try to work out what's going on. Like if they're on a wireless device and they've walked outside, well, there's a big chunk of concrete between them and the access point and maybe the signal can't get through anymore. So check if you think it was a cable, check your cable connections, make sure everything's pushed in and clicked. We'll go over that um, lovely sound when we're in classroom. But if you ever looked at network cables, it's got a little fly tab that when you push it in the socket, it makes a very distinctive sound, clicking sound when it's pushed in correctly. Um, one of the things you can do if you believe all your cables and that are connected, use that ping command to actually check. You can talk to the gateway. If you can talk to the gateway, see if you can um, ping your DNS server because you may have lost the DNS server and you can't translate cisco.com into an IP address, for example. So you implement a solution. Now, if you're in a business, depending on the level of critical activities of these devices, depends on whether you do this maintenance out of hours or straight away and depending on the level of impact towards users within the enterprise also determines when you do that fix. So troubleshooting requires you to verify it. So if it, again, scenario of not being able to connect to the internet, check your IP config to display your IP addresses, check your coming, uh, excuse me, <coughs> check your ping command is working across those end devices and if you cannot come up with a solution talk to your colleagues and seek help generally you're not the only person in a help desk environment and there's other people that you can bounce ideas off now hopefully they've got more experience and can pinpoint the solution. Troubleshooting is 100% experience based. The more you do it, the more problems you find, the more solutions to problems you, you discover, the better at troubleshooting you become. We can only teach you the basic steps, the actual experience, and knowledge comes with time and doing. And part of that knowledge is recording the issue, what the symptoms were, what you did to fix it. Okay, do your paperwork. So some of the common problems and solutions. The LED lights on the network card are not on. Most common problem, the cable is unplugged at one end or not plugged in correctly. Okay, so reconnect it, check it, swap it out. Um, to see whether the network card is functioning, you ping the 127.001 network address. You might need to replace the card. So I'm not going to read all of these out. You 
can read these and go through these examples within the reading of the chapter. Okay, you, you don't need me to actually read the slide to you. I'm not going to, I'm just going to skip these and get to the end. Because you're all probably asleep. Because nobody's talking to me on chat. you just all gone to sleep again, haven't you? you curled up in a nice warm dinner and gone back to sleep. Hmm? Don't blame you. Okay, so what we covered was a very brief and broad explanation of uh, physical and logical addressing. The... <laughs> <laughs> that got some responses. Okay, Jacob saying it's not far off, but he's still awake. <laughs> um, <laughs> Christopher's going, yeah, that sounds good. I might do that. Yeah, hmm. don't blame us. All right, so wireless networking works really well within a small area. And we can extend that area using mesh networks. Um, we had a brief look at how to set up a router and domestic router. We had a look at changing this firewall settings on that. So port forwarding, allowing traffic through, setting up uh, quality of service. Uh, brief discussion on Internet of Things and explain the basic steps of troubleshooting. Now, within this chapter, if you look into the um, index for the chapter you will see labs and packet tracer activities to do now we cannot do the labs per se because we don't have the physical devices to do the labs such as installing a network card until we get back into the classroom so as i've said a few times when we get back in we'll catch up on the lab work as quickly as possible but there's nothing stopping you working your way through the packet tracer activities which are accessible through the curriculum you can download the packet tracer application which i believe most of you have already done so um, if you want i can spend some time going through the packet tracer activities with you to show you how it works um, and we'll do that as a separate recording for today 